Hello, everybody. My name is Matthew, and I am also known as Odyssey64 on the channel. Today, I want to talk about two things that are unfortunately no longer going to be with us. Those being the eShops of the Wii U and the 3DS. Now, I will admit these things are very, very important to me, despite the Wii U considered to be a financial failure. And, well, I can see that. There's still a lot of things that, at least to me, are very important to me. Some of the memories I've made, and I'm sure all of you guys have some as well. So, this is just going to be a little, well, not necessarily a little. It's probably going to be a lot, actually. Um, looking at the script now, it's like 14 pages long. So, uh... Yeah, longer than a lot of the essays I would write for some of my uh, assignments, but hey, it's what it is, and uh, this is sort of just a love letter to this generation, and I hope you guys enjoy. As many of you know, on March 27th, 2023, at 8pm EST, Nintendo finally pulled the plug on the Nintendo eShop for both the Wii U and the 3DS. In this video, I want to talk about both of these systems and go over some of the fond memories I had with them. This video may get emotional at times for some people, so I hope you've got some tissues just in case, and I'll have timestamps if you're more interested in certain events that I'll try my best to explain in detail. I originally planned to have some of these points become videos or YouTube shorts, but since they relate so closely to this topic already, I decided to put them here, so again, use the timestamps if you want to. Also, I'll be talking about the Wii U first, even if the events may not add up in the video chronologically to my experiences with the 3DS. I don't know how long this video is going to be at the time of starting this script, so without further ado, let's get started. December 25th, 2012. That was the day me and my brother got the Nintendo Wii U for Christmas, and it came with a couple games for us to play together. Epic Mickey 2, Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transform, New Super Mario Bros U, you know, the usual E for everyone's starter kit of Mario and Animal mascots. I've always been a fan of Mario and Sonic, especially since I grew up on their games on the Wii like Mario Kart Wii, Sonic and the Black Knight, Sonic Colors, Super Mario Galaxy, and I essentially had every Mario and Sonic the Olympic Games ever since London 2012. This system not only allowed me to play new games, but also the older ones I just mentioned which made me falsely believe that every system worked that way. Boy was I wrong. Anyways, I purposely left out one game that we got because one had lit a spark that would later turn into a wildfire of me trying out new IPs Nintendo had alongside other gaming companies. And to be honest, since I didn't have any access to the internet at the time, I thought everything was made by either Nintendo or Sega. Hey, you can't blame me. I was like 7 and, again, I didn't have access to the internet until I was like 14. Anyway, you're probably wondering what game could have introduced me to a wide world of famous Nintendo characters. Well. That game was Nintendo Land. For those of you who don't know, Nintendo Land was one of the launch titles with the Wii U, and it really focused on promoting the controls with the gamepad and the potential it had to work not only as a separate controller, but as a separate screen. Needless to say, I had a lot of fun with Nintendo Land even though I didn't play it that much. That is often because whenever I wanted to play one of the better games like the Mario, Animal Crossing, or Luigi's Mansion games, I had to play with my brother and he only wanted to play the cooperative games like The Legend of Zelda, or use the Metroid ship in the Metroid multiplayer for co-op or versus. And let me just say this is where I spend most of my time in Nintendo Land. If I was going to get my brother to play Nintendo Land, I would have to play the Metroid game and let him use the gamepad to fly that ship around in rain terror from above. Thankfully there was a battle area where that was less of a problem, to say the least. Looking back, this is where so many new places and ideas came to me. Animal Crossing, F-Zero, Pikmin, Yoshi's Island, Luigi having his own game series, The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Balloon Fight. All these IPs I didn't pay much attention to back then, but seeing where I am now made me realize that this is the introduction to a wider world two years later in 2014. I would step out into that exact world. Two years later in 2014, my dad, my brother, and I went to a local GameStop and looked at some of the Wii U games. There were two that caught our eyes and we each picked one. My brother chose Hyrule Warriors and the game I chose, well, let's just say that even though I didn't know it yet, my world was going to be turned upside down. The game I chose 
was Super Smash Brothers for the Wii U. This was it. This is where I learned so much about so many iconic characters from so many different games and companies, and it made me the Nintendo gamer I am today. It had so much to offer me. A large list of characters featuring Mario characters. Oh, cool, Sonic's here too. Then there's Link, Samus. Oh, there's a lot of Pokemon from the show that me and my brother would watch. But who are all these other characters? Who's this Marth guy? Fox? Meta Knight? Pit? Mega Man? Pac-Man? Shulk? Who are all these people? I had no idea who all these characters were, so I primarily stuck with the Mario, Zelda, and Pokemon characters at the start. Those questions would only get more numerous when characters like Ryu and Cloud joined as DLC, a concept which was new to me. As time passed, however, when I continued to play the game as both characters I knew and didn't know, I wanted to learn more about their origins. I love video game music, and when you hear that... <laughs> start to think, man, this character in game seems so cool, I wonder where they come from. This is what brings me to the main collectible of Super Smash Bros for Wii U, trophies. This is where my curiosity would peak. Not only did I know a little bit about the characters in the game, I also knew of some of their allies like Krom from Fire Emblem, Dunban from Xenoblade Chronicles, and on the trophy it would tell me what games they were from and what system the game was on. Keep that bit in mind because it is very, very important. Again, my access to the internet was very limited, so any of this information was new and exciting for me at the time. Additionally, older mascots like Mega Man, Kirby, and Ness in the extras menu, you could play little demos of their games like Mega Man 2 and Earthbound. Sure, it was only for like 30 seconds, but it was enough to pique my interest for Mega Man and Kirby and a couple others. Though if I'm being honest, it was primarily the music which convinced me to try out some of these games. Here are a few examples of songs that convinced me to try out the games where they came from. Side note, there are no particular order because some games I had to wait years to play, and I'll explain why when we get to the 3DS portion of the video.
The Super Smash Bros. series introduced me to so many new characters and stories, and for that, I am eternally grateful for the series. Even with Ultimate on the Switch, I've been interested in games like Metal Gear Solid, Persona 5, and a few others. This introduction meant so much to me and made me realize there was a wider world of gaming to explore. Speaking of, even though its presence wasn't in Smash Bros. for Wii U, the sheer courage to try something new introduced me to one of my favorite game series of all time. May 28th, 2015. Boy, does that make me feel old. If you've been on the channel for long enough, you would know one of my favorite game series got started on this console. That series became known as Splatoon. Not only was this Nintendo's first new IP in possibly years, but for me, it was my very first shooter game. At first I dismissed it, since I had no idea where it came from, but then I heard this. I'm just kidding. But it seemed really fun as the trailers went by and I saw more gameplay of it. Then, on Christmas of 2015, my brother got it. Let me explain. So, my parents knew I wanted this game. So, there was no way they would spite me and buy it from my brother when he had zero interest in it, right? Well, yeah, my parents accidentally put my brother's name on the present, and because he's stubborn and a hoarder and it had his name on it, the game belonged to him and he wouldn't give it up. Needless to say, I was pretty devastated, but he allowed me to play it if I asked. Younger siblings and their custom hunger for power, am I right? Anyway, let me reiterate something that you're probably sick of hearing by now, and spoilers, you're gonna hear it again many more times. My internet access at a young age was still very limited, so I hardly ever got a chance to play online. The only times being on weekends when my dad would get home from work, I would play on his account and have access to online games. Hold it! Something doesn't add up here. If I could barely play online, what would make me so quick to love Splatoon? I mean, I only had access to the story mode, and yes, I played through it. Well, it's simple. The world. The characters and the music. It was all so... fun. And whenever I did get to play online, I cherished that more because I had limited time. I remember asking my dad a week in advance if I could use his account during the weekend to play the Cali vs. Marie Splatfest during that weekend because I just had to be there. I loved everything about Splatoon's art style, gameplay, characters. It just felt like a Nintendo game, and boy, was it one of my favorites for sure. It has gone through a rough time but it's still really successful and I'll probably continue to buy the games until I can't anymore or they stop making them. I mean, I pretty much own all of the manga, so you know I love this series and it all started here. What everyone considered to be a failure of a console. The last thing I have for you involving the Wii U is a little sad story, but it has a happy ending. On Christmas of 2016, we were opening our presents and I got two games, The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess HD and Paper Mario Color Splash. Both games I thought I'd like to play, and even decided to buy Paper Mario Sticker Star to try my hand at a Paper Mario game. Unfortunately, our Wii U had one issue. The gamepad wasn't charging anymore. This meant that any game that we needed the gamepad to play couldn't be played anymore, so... Although I could still play Twilight Princess since I had the Pro Controller, Paper Mario, Color Splash, Nintendo Land, Splatoon... All these games were rendered unplayable. So we did the one thing that made the most sense. We got rid of them. I don't even remember what we got, but this was devastating to me. I'd gotten a new game for Christmas and now I couldn't even play it at all. Not to mention some of my favorites were unplayable as well. Fortunately, much later, we did realize that the charger we had for our Wii U was actually the incorrect one. Yeah, somehow after all this time we just realized we had a charger that wasn't supposed to come with our Wii U. Did anyone else have this issue where your Wii U pad wouldn't charge? Let me know in the comments. Now with all these old games gone, I'll have to find ways to buy them back. Just recently I found a copy of Splatoon at a card and electronics store at my local mall, and even though the servers are probably never coming back, I'm still happy I got it. Who knows, maybe I'll try to buy back some of the games I had to get rid of. But that's a story for another day. 
So that's some major moments with my Wii U and the journey I went on with it since its arrival during a Christmas morning so long ago. I want to try and add in a nice segue to the 3DS portion, but I can't really do that because I want to save all my retrospective thoughts for the end of the video. Additionally, I can't explain exact dates for this portion because it's a combination of events before and during and after I got my Wii U, but I'll try my best to estimate dates when I can. A lot of these, I think, will be speedrounds as the 3DS introduced to me a lot of my first games in certain series. But let's start off, of course, at the beginning. Long ago, in a moment lost to time, one father handed down his 3DS to his two sons. Not many games were available, but it was a new era after all, as both sons had their own DSi XLs, and the concept of 3D games was new to them. The games that were available to them were Mario Tennis Open, Lego Pirates of the Caribbean, Mario Kart 7, and something else. Something that, unbeknownst to the eldest son, we introduce him to one of the most iconic game worlds in history. This was my very first 3D Legend of Zelda game. I would say my first period, but that goes to the Four Swords Special Edition thing I got on my DS. I don't have much to say about it since I don't remember much, but it was definitely quite the enjoyable experience. I didn't know Link had a name, so I named him after myself and went through the Great Deku Tree, Dodongo's Cavern, and Jabu Jabu's Belly. Then after getting the Master Sword, I stopped. The reason? Simple. I got stuck on the Water Temple, well, a little more than that. You see, I never actually beaten a Legend of Zelda game until I got access to the internet, let's say 13, 14-ish years old. I was very young and I didn't understand how most of it worked, but once I did figure it out much later, I actually did name the character Link and beat the game, and every Legend of Zelda game since, with a little help for Wind Waker too. Those dang Triforce Shards, never again. Regardless, this is my first step into understanding how 3D puzzles worked in Zelda, and it was what really got me into the series. Looking back, the whole story of growing up and feeling you've lost your childhood to time is honestly relatable. But I didn't care about that at the time, I just wanted to beat up bad guys and save Hyrule from Ganondorf. You can imagine my excitement when Ganondorf was confirmed for Tears of the Kingdom. I'm so excited! Ocarina of Time, while being my first Zelda game, only comes second to Breath of the Wild, and while we're on the topic of Zelda games, jumping really, really, really far into the future, like four plus years, I want to talk about a little game that, while alone, was fun, but with others, was even better. This little adventure, while not anything super crazy to most, holds itself very near and dear to my heart. The Legend of Zelda Triforce Heroes. Now, you may be thinking, Triforce Heroes? Why that game? You only had a little brother, don't you need three people to play that game? Well, you may be right, that I did only have a brother to play games with during this time. I had one other person that I would sometimes get the chance to play with. Enter my little cousin Jaden, aka Mr. Okami Fox. Back when he used to live close to us, we would always bring our 3DSs to play with, and a favorite of ours being Triforce Heroes. I honestly believe this is how we've bonded so closely to where we kind of see him as a brother in a sense. Both he and I had the game and my brother didn't, so he had to use download play, and we would just do random levels and use the cool outfits the game had. Additionally, we would coordinate so that we would each get our favorite colors. Jane would be green, I would be blue, and my brother would be red. Sure, we didn't exactly beat the game together, but it was really fun playing that endless dungeon mode in some of the other levels too. Now that I've briefly touched on my history with The Legend of Zelda, let's return to the beginning of the 3DS era when I first discovered the Nintendo eShop. 
here we are circling back to the eShop and this is where I would get information for a variety of games thanks to the videos Nintendo would post there. Things like Nintendo Directs, Nintendo Minute, rest in peace, but glad Kit and Krista are vibing with their podcast. And these were how I got introduced to new games and what to look forward to. This is what I was saying when I mentioned my small internet access. This is how I would get any information about upcoming games. Splatoon? Watch the Direct on my 3DS. Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS? Watch the Direct on my 3DS. This continued until I got access to YouTube, which is much, much later. Additionally, with the eShop, I now learned of being able to download games for the first time and being able to transfer my DS games over. The only thing I bought on that old 3DS was the original Metroid, which I barely played, so it's not super significant in my eyes. However, I did start downloading games on my next 3DS, the 3DS XL. Now, I can't remember exactly what I downloaded in its entirety. The games were Box Box Boy, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening DX, and a small little indie game known as Ninja Smasher. Comment below if you know what this game was and or played it. The game that shockingly had the most significance behind it was Ninja Smasher. This is unfortunately another sad story, but it also has another happy ending. It is based on a major event that I should have explained before this, but again, I'm trying to make sure everything in this video is topical instead of chronological, so here we are. I'll summarize the timeline of events over at the end, so don't worry if you're getting confused. Anyway, our entire family of four headed to a DSW in our local mall. If you don't know what a DSW is, it's basically a shoe store. Like usual, my brother and I brought our 3DSs, and I was just doing my thing and he was doing his. Well, to put it simply, I dropped it. I wasn't even that far off the ground, but for some reason it decided enough was enough, and when I picked it up, the screen didn't turn on. Everything else seemed perfectly normal, the screen wasn't cracked, the lights turned on, but nothing happened. After a while, and my dad did a little troubleshooting, he realized that my 3DS got something which is known as the black screen of death, rendering my 3DS unplayable. And those few 3DS games I downloaded were now gone. A while later, but not before the summer was over, my parents took me to GameStop and we traded an Epic Mickey 2, a game me and my brother absolutely hated, to cover a tiny bit of a cost for the brand new, new Nintendo 3DS XL. I was ecstatic. I'd wanted it ever since it came out, and I would never stop talking about it, and since I played Smash Bros, I wanted to try Xenoblade Chronicles because it looked so cool! I would have to wait a while to play it though because I was too young at the time, and by the time I was old enough to play it, it came out on the Switch. But regardless, despite the sacrifices that were made, I finally had it. Now I was able to re-download all my games, right? Well, not exactly. You see, at the time, I didn't have a Nintendo account, so when I looked to re-download my games, none of them were there. No way to download Legend of Zelda Four Swords, no Box Box Boy, no Link's Awakening, and most disappointing of all, no Ninja Smasher. Now Ninja Smasher was a very special case. Granted, the Four Swords adventure game was limited and eventually removed, I had no idea why Ninja Smasher was removed until I was writing the script. Apparently the company that made it actually went bankrupt, and when it did, it was sold to another company and eventually disappeared the eShop in the West. It was still available in the East and was eventually available on PC, but it seemed lost forever to me. Until I checked the eShop about four days after I started writing this, and I saw that it was planned to be released on that week, which made me surprisingly more happy than it probably should have been. So yeah, that's the most pivotal moment in my history with the 3DS. The system specifically. To go back to the games, let's go to a few more memories. I'll keep these ones a little bit on the shorter side for sake of time, but they're no less important. Starting with the earlier of the few. Animal Crossing New Leaf was, as you would guess, my very first Animal Crossing game. I got it pre-owned at my local GameStop and immediately started playing, not realizing I started a new game on another person's file. I actually didn't realize until much later that you were supposed to be the mayor of the town, so I just did random things until I figured out I had to delete the save file, named my town something I can't remember, and started the game how I was supposed to. I ran around and did the usual, paying off crippling debt, building up my shops, going on island adventures, all was fine and dandy. However, there is one thing that ruined my island. The bamboo shoots. These freaking things would not stop growing. I couldn't cut them all down by myself, and eventually they covered a very large portion of the town. There were times when I thought about resetting, but I already put in a lot of time to the town I had built up. But all that changed when Animal Crossing New Leaf Welcome Amiibo was announced and then later released. 
I sold off my town to Tom Nook and used the money to max out my house and build up my town much faster. This town I named Pallet. Yes, I named my Animal Crossing locations after game locations. I mean, I named my New Horizons island named Outset, and I will continue this trend. This town was great. I even had painstakingly put down pathways everywhere to make nice little roads. It was nice and relaxing all around. Nintendo, please add back the Amiibo Villagers, please. There are a lot of things I could mention. My first Pokemon game being Pokemon Y, my first Kirby game being Triple Deluxe, but one other first sticks out to me because it has influenced many other subsequent purchases and has made me enjoy strategy games and RPGs alike. That being Fire Emblem. Again, thanks to Super Smash Bros, I was introduced to all these characters that Nintendo was clearly trying to promote, and I was interested in them, sure, but with so many of them on extremely old hardware or just not available where I was, I was kind of stuck. However, that changed completely when a new character was available as DLC, Corrin for Fire Emblem Fates. Ever since my 13th birthday, I've been entranced with Fire Emblem with Fates being a close second to my favorite Engage overall, and to be honest, my favorite game on the 3DS. It had everything I wanted in an RPG, a wide cast of characters, high stakes stories, unbelievable moments, and yes, of course, the relationships you can form with characters. Now I can't exactly delve in too deep about my experiences with the Fire Emblem series, primarily because you guys on the channel have basically never seen me play it, but trust me when I say I absolutely love this series. I specifically want to talk about Fates and touch on Awakening a little bit later. I didn't play Shadows of Valentia, primarily because I want to spend more time on Birthright first than Conquest, and I still haven't beaten Revelation. So let's start off with my favorite thing about Fire Emblem, the support conversations and relationship building. Now, I consider myself a hopeless romantic, so putting two characters for fun and stat boosts was always something I enjoyed in every Fire Emblem game I would play. I'd often try my best to match personalities together, but also base relationships off the story. For example, this is Takumi, one of the nobles in Hoshido. He has two retainers, Oboro and Hanada. Now on that route, I had Hanada marry Hana, and they had a son named Hisame. Get it? Hana, Hanada, Hisame? All of them sword fighters? Anyway, the real spicy stuff was about Oboro. I had her marry Saizo. Now what makes this interesting and makes me regret this choice is that Aboro actually had an unrequited love towards Takumi. I only realized this after I killed her in the conquest route. Thankfully I had her marry first, so it's kind of like she moved on from him. Regardless, it's little lore pieces like that that makes me want to make all of their wishes come true. In all games, by the way, not just Fates. So you may be wondering, who I made the main character marry, right? Well, to add a little spice to it, Characters like Korn and Robin from Awakening are actually foils for the player. 
You can customize them, stats and all. I wish they brought this back, but I understand why they didn't with the cutscenes. So I made three separate versions of me for each route. For Revelation, I married Felicia. In Conquest, I married Camilla. And for Birthright, I married Azura. Now before you start writing your comment like, Ew, you married Camilla, her personality is garbage. Or, ew, you married Azura, she's her cousin. First of all, hey, I like what I like. And second, I didn't know Azura was the main character's cousin until I played Revelation. Come on, anyone who has married Azura before playing Revelation can attest to this. Also in medieval times, it was common for cousins to marry, so ta- Now there's one little critique with this sort of thing in Fire Emblem that I feel Three Houses did the best. It doesn't make any sense to get married during such world-ending circumstances, let alone have children. Sure, there could be arguments for that, wanting to make the most of the time you have, but this is where I think Three Houses did it better. You build a relationship, there are some parts you can't access until later on, and you get a happy ever after at the end. It feels more satisfying that way. However, I won't object to it in the game, and child units are kinda crazy busted in combat. Speaking of, there's this one child character, Ryoma's son, Shiro. I actually let him get attacked and was defeated, again I played on casual mode, during the paralogue to recruit him and I didn't realize that I actually couldn't use him and I already saved so I guess Lorai's realm I had him stay in the deep realms? Oh well. Maybe I'll play the game again, specifically making sure I get things right, have a borrow Mary Takumi, and try someone else since I know Azura is my cousin. Now for combat. I was new to this game so I wasn't used to how Fire Emblem worked so I ended up playing Phoenix mode on Conquest since I couldn't grind, but on Birthright, there was one combination of units that was absolutely destructive. Ryoma paired with Saizo as a Dreadfighter. These two were indestructible, with easy dodges and crits, and astras and lethalities. It was just so fun to watch. After all this, I made it to the finale. I watched Azura die before my very eyes. So I was left to raise two kids on my own. Yeah, so anyone who marries Azura actually gets two children as each child is similar to the father while Azura is the exception. So yeah, I literally watched her disappear. Sort of. Until I played the DLC featuring the children and that's when I realized they were using my exact same character models as the ones used in my birthright account. And since Azura's son, Shigure's entire goal was to bring back Azura, that would mean that we would all live happily ever after after the final boss of the DLC. I think. And this is why I like Three Houses Relationship System a little bit better. That way I don't watch the character I literally married in-game die due to plot. Far Emblem Awakening was the other one I bought on the 3DS, but that was a more recent purchase, literally so that way I could get it before the eShop closed. And again, to people's obvious and understandable disgust, I married Lucina, who was literally just born in the present timeline for those of you who haven't played Awakening. The Lucina who fights is Krom's daughter from the future, which puts Morgan, my character's daughter, in a strange spot as she doesn't know where she came from, which makes sense. Also, why did I marry Lucina? Well, there's this one cutscene that changes depending on if you're her husband or mother, i.e. if you married Krom. Plus I made the choice to sacrifice myself to keep Grima from reincarnating. Unfortunately, I didn't realize there was more DLC for Awakening, but I can't buy it anymore, so I guess everything in the future gets saved as well? Now you may be wondering why I didn't get Shadows of Valentia. Well, the answer is simple. There's no representation of myself. I don't even think you can rename Almond Celica, and I know for a fact you can't customize them, but I wasn't interested in it as the story was very, very on rails, with not much customization with relationships. Though I can hear it now, oh, he's only interested if he can insert himself in the game and isn't interested in the best aspects of Fire Emblem. My response to that is, yeah, I love actively having a role in a story, and the lead role through Byleth and Alir or fully customized characters like Korn or Robin are perfectly fine with me. Sure, you can say I'm only interested in the relationship part of Fire Emblem because I don't play on hardcore classic or won't play the game where that either takes a back seat or isn't even in the game at all, but I've played several RPGs where that isn't a factor, but you can't blame me for liking a little love in my games. I mean, even though I have no specific character that was me, I love the first Xenoblade Chronicles, not the biggest fan of the second, and I love Shulk and Fiora. It's just with Fire Emblem, it's different. And I like that difference. Although it probably won't happen, I hope we get another customizable avatar in the future. Sure, it would mean no high resolution anime or pre rendered cutscenes, but I still miss being able to represent myself in a Fire Emblem game. Bouncing off of that, they could kind of still do those types of cutscenes if they made them first person like Fates and Awakening. 
If I were to make my ideal Fire Emblem game, I would make your role of the character similar to Robin instead of Corrin, where you're more of a supporting character, as I see the flaws in Corrin's character. I would also not bring back the children aspect, as that is fine, and it should probably stay that way. Awakening in Fates is good enough. Finally, I'd save Marriage for the end or near the end, like in Three Houses and Engage, as it feels more rewarding for all your hard work for building that relationship. But keep the little mini games that allow you to get to know the character better and that you can have support conversations and fun activities. Side note, I still find it funny how they censor the relationship building in Fire Emblem Fates compared to how it works in other versions overseas. Look it up if you're interested. Overall, what do I think of my first introduction to Fire Emblem on the 3DS? Well, I loved it, and I still do to this day. I bought Fates, Awakening, Warriors, Three Hopes, Three Houses, and Engage, and I play the mobile game Fire Emblem Heroes, and I'll probably buy the next Fire Emblem game. And with that, that essentially brings us to now. For those of you who have watched up to this point, thank you so much. And for those of you who skipped to this point, hello, my name is Odyssey64, how you doing? Subscribe for more awesome content. Now, let's quickly summarize this little timeline. Christmas of 2012, me and my brother got our Wii U with Nintendo Land, Epic Mickey, Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed, New Super Mario Bros., and then about a year later, my dad gave me and my brother his 3DS with Ocarina of Time, Mario Tennis Open, and Parts of the Caribbean. Later, I got Animal Crossing New Leaf, and I used the eShop for my main source of news for games. I eventually hear of Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, and eventually got it. Afterwards, me and my brother each got our, a 3DS for ourselves. Over a large span of time, I got Kirby Triple Deluxe, Download the Box Box Boy, Ninja Smasher, Link's Awakening, Pokemon Y, and Tomodachi Life. Then, Christmas of 2015, my brother got Splatoon, and later, I dropped my 3DS and a DSW, and I got the Black Screen of Death, then I got the new 3DS XL. Then, I get Fire Emblem Fates, play through Birthright and Conquest, Animal Crossing Welcome Amiibo comes out, then finally, I get Twilight Princess and Color Splash, but we have to get rid of a bunch of Wii U games, including Color Splash, and that brings us to today. Well, that's it for me. There are many other stories I could tell, but that would make this video much longer than it already is. These are just the most important parts of my journey, and now I want to share some of the memories of my community with these systems. Monokuma says, Me and my big sister used to play Animal Crossing New Leaf together. Wow, I yearn for simpler times. Tazadion just simply says, Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix in all caps with tear emojis. I feel that. I never got to actually play that, honestly. I wish I did. Jack says, Kid Icarus, the only good game I have, and I will also sell that game when it gets crazy expensive. Well... Uh, happy to tell you that game is very expensive now. It's over like $100 now, so uh, hopefully you get a good amount of cash for it. And now finally we have Disable saying, I remember being able to access the eShop for the first time, browsing through the free applications since I couldn't afford the paid stuff. I downloaded apps such as Netflix and Swapnote, and they took forever to download too. I downloaded an app called PD Computer, and I had no idea what it did. All I know is that I was free. Fast forward to 2012-2013 when I got my Wii U. I used it to browse the Wii U eShop a lot. This is when I first started downloading paid games, mainly just Minecraft, Telemeo. I also got free games such as Zen Pinball and Cube Shift. I also got Amiibo Tap and that mini Mario game with the Amiibo. I also got Super Mario World and the Lost Levels and also Mario 3. Fast forward to 2017, I got the new 2DS and Smash Bros. This is where the eShop got utilized the most for me. I downloaded games such as Yoshi's Island and New Super Mario Bros. 2, and some retro games like Mario World. I also purchased DLC for Smash Bros. Overall, I will miss the eShop and all the memories it brought. RIP the eShop. And I definitely can relate to that as once you kinda got access to your own money and your own funds, you really started using the eShop a lot more. Well, here we are at the end. It's been a while since I started writing this script and it's about to be the end of April. It's April 30th right now. This generation has so many memories that I'll forever cherish, and I hope all of you feel the same. Sure, call it nostalgia pandering, but this is honestly my favorite generation. Sure, it may have been considered a financial failure, but it opened up so many doors for me to explore so many genres and IPs that I got to experience solely because there were so many introductory games that were released on these systems. Additionally, it was one of the only generations where Nintendo had games planned for two consoles to look forward to always keeping things interesting with so many options and new things to try. I will forever love the Wii U and 3DS, 3DS a little bit more. And I hope the people who grew up during the lifespan of this gaming generation with the Switch will find just as much fondness as I had growing up with this one.
Yeah, this video took way too long to get done. I got distracted by school and other things and I would just get extremely tired so I wouldn't get around to writing the script and uploading and editing and all that stuff. But it's finally done, although I should have had this done about within the week the 3DS shut down. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video and enjoyed the this generation as much as I. I mean, yeah, I still have my uh, 3DS with me and I'm and I just started on um, replaying Fire Emblem Fates Birthright, and of course I, as I said in the video, I um, I was able to find a copy of Splatoon 1, and I wanted to play it, but it doesn't seem like that I'll get the chance to. And yeah, I hope you guys found th find this place as a good spot to... Uh, Reminisce with others in the comments about your wonderful memories with either the 3DS or the Wii U in any way, shape, or form, because although I kind of grew up in the Wii generation, I didn't really become conscious of what I was playing until, uh, until I got this bad boy over here and I started, um, lear learning all these things and all these introductory games that came out, so yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. And uh, and if you do want to watch something like right now, there will be a video right over here, and also a video right over here, and you can also subscribe right around here. So uh, yeah, see you guys there.